Policymakers are still trying to understand what happened and, and, and why and, and, and the way out. Okay, so um, some of what I'll be talking to you about today comes from a paper I wrote for the Journal of Economic Perspectives. It was published uh, a couple months ago in the fall 2010 issue in a symposium that was called Macro After the Financial Crisis. So I wrote a paper and there were four other economists who were asked to write a paper for that symposium. And the journal asked us to address two questions. Um, one was, uh, you know, what's, what's our view about the crisis? And the second is, you know, what's the future course of macroeconomic theory? How will that evolve uh, following the crisis? So in particular, what I'll try to talk about today is why the crisis, uh, why the recession was so deep, why it's lasted for such a long time, and how and why does it differ across countries? So I'll start off with looking at a little bit of data. This is a picture of the civilian employment rate. That's the number of workers per uh, civilian working age population, 16 to 65. And you see here that the economy was fairly stable from 2002 up until about 2007. So jobs were being created at roughly the rate of population growth. And then we see the recession of 2008, uh, 2009. And the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is a nonpartisan collection of economists, has a business cycle dating committee. And their charge is to date the start and the end of recessions. And the National Bureau of Economic Research dated the end of the recession in the middle of 2009. Um, the employment rate really hasn't changed much. <coughs> Since the recession, uh, since the recession was termed to be officially over, um, so what you want to take away from this is that we had really remarkable drop in employment, and jobs have yet really to come back very much. Okay, at some level, this recession is like a lot of other economic crises. Um, it's a little bit of a murder mystery. You know, what I mean by that is, when good economies go bad. Good economies being, say, the United States or Japan or other economies in Western Europe, 
It's a little bit like a whodunit. So a novel in which there's a victim and there's typically a lot of interesting possible suspects. Um, so in the case of any, you know, so I've listed some of those, some of those here. Now, in terms of the current recession, there's uh, a common view held by many that the recession was caused by the financial crisis that really came to a head in the fall of 2008. And it's certainly not possibly the case, but what I'll uh, talk about today is that really no economic theory we have on the table, including economic models that feature financial market imperfections or financial market frictions are at all consistent with the facts. Um, I'll try to set out what facts a successful theory should explain um, and why are we afar from such a theory. And at some level, the recession is not well understood, not well understood from the standpoint of understanding you know, deeply what happened and why and the road out. And I'll point to future avenues that, that hopefully can be productive in, as we go forward. Okay, so I'm going to show you a little bit more data. This is a picture of real GDP, gross domestic product, production of final goods and services, on a proportional scale. And what I want to highlight to you is that the United States has been a remarkably stable and prosperous country because we see the long-run records, stretching back here from 1800 up until the present, and I've terminated this picture in around 2006. So you see the remarkable growth that we as citizens of the United States have enjoyed. And here's the Great Depression in the 1930s. Um, this is the World War II expansion. And in particular, take a look. The red is the trend line. That's smooth economic growth. And the blue is the actual economic performance. And what you see over roughly the last 30 years or so is that trend growth, the smooth trend line, and actual economic performance were remarkably similar to each other. This all really came to an end with, with our most re recent recession. <coughs> Here's a slightly different way of looking at that same picture. What I've done is I've subtracted off the deviations between actual performance and the trend line. And here you see uh, the Great Depression, where the economy is about 35 or 40 percent below trend. But again, take a look here from roughly the last 30 years. And these. Um, uh, here's zero. Zero means the actual performance and trend are the same, and these are plus and uh, these are plus and minus four percent. So almost always the economy is, with, is within maybe two or three percent of its trend behavior. So remarkable stability and growth for the 30 years before the Great Recession. So now tell, let me tell you a little bit about why the Great Recession is so different. And many of you will say, well, sure, it's different. It was, you know, it was much worse. Yeah, it is much worse, but it differs in a number of other ways that point clues as to why common thinking about the Great Recession <coughs> is misleading and why we need to look to other, other areas. So I'm going to start off with an identity which just says, why over in this is just per capita real GDP. So per capita income or per capita production, a measure of how much goods and services, how much income, is generated per person in the United States. Well, that depends upon two things. It depends upon worker productivity, so real GDP per worker, and it depends upon how many people we have working. So any economic downturn, whether it's the Great Recession or any other, must be due to either lower worker productivity or lower employment. And in particular, the percent change is equal to the percent change in economic activity at any point in time is equal to the percent change in productivity and the percent change in labor. Now, the sense in which our current recession differs is that almost all previous post World War II recessions are largely due to fairly small drops in employment and fairly large drops in productivity. The current recession is totally the opposite. There's almost no productivity change, no productivity decline. Rather, the drop in income and output in the current recession is all due to a drop in employment. Now, the Great Recession that hit a number of European countries and other advanced countries such as Japan is exactly the opposite. Those recessions also had very large drops in income and output, but they were almost entirely due 
to drops in productivity, not drops in employment. Okay, so as we go through this, we're going to talk about why this is important and perhaps factors that might explain why the recession is so different. What I'd like you to start thinking about is that very similar financial crises in which the values of some mortgage-backed securities became impaired and that was related at some level with housing booms, very similar financial crises hit all these countries. Okay? So one question is, with all these similar financial crises, why does the recession look so different across countries? Okay, so I'm going to show you a little bit of data uh, on this. Um, what I've done here is this upper panel is uh, all post-war U.S. recessions. Um, and what you'll see is that real GDP or real production fell between peak and trough about 4.5%. And employment, an alternative measure of labor input as total hours work, fell roughly 3 to 4%. Now here's the Great Recession. So output drop is much larger. Um, but the drop in labor input is much, much larger. And you can see how this stands in contrast for the Great Recession in the U.S., with respect to the other G7 countries. So the other high income advanced countries, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the UK. So you see one thing is that they had <coughs> drops in, a, in output and production and income as big or bigger than the US. But they had relatively mild declines in employment. So what that tells you, based on the slide we just looked at, is that this recession is all coming from drops in the number of people working. These recessions are not involving so much declines in people working, but rather lower productivity on the part of those workers. So with that data in mind, now let's think about trying to diagnose the causes of the Great Recession. And Recent research has been done um, among research economists that um, provides what I'm going to call a toolkit that works analogously, that works to help us identify and understand proximal causes of recessions, that works analogously to how physicians diagnose an illness. And so what I mean by that is that if you're not feeling well, you go to see a doctor, and what they do is they measure deviations from normal patterns and things like heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, body temperature, etc. So they're using thermometers and different tools to determine whether any of your vital signs are substantially different than normal. So if you have a temperature of 103, they say, you've got a fever because that's a substantial departure from normal 98.6. And if you have a fever, that points in the direction of diagnosing an illness that's associated with producing, as a symptom, a high fever. We're going to do the same thing here with economies. And in place of thermometers, we're going to use some different tools. They're going to help us understand departures from, departures from normal in things like labor markets, capital markets, and an economy's ability to combine capital and labor to produce output. And I'm going to call those business cycle diagnostics. What we'll ask three questions, is the labor market functioning normally, is the capital market functioning normally, and is production functioning normally? And based upon the outcome of the asking those questions, we'll get some hints as to what might be going wrong with our economy and other economies, much like a doctor gets a hint from understanding what's wrong with you when you have a fever or when you have a very high, high pulse rate, etc. Okay. In particular, what we're going to ask is, are the usual constructs of supply and demand being equated? So when we think about markets and economy, you know, there's demand and there's supply. And as you've all learned, the price of that market is what equates demand and supply and gives us market clearing. Okay, so the idea that supply and demand become equal to each other because the price in that market, the wage rate in the labor market, the return to capital in the capital market, 
those prices move to bring supply and demand into balance. So we're going to ask whether during the recession that's true. And if it's not true, in what direction is it and by how much? Okay. So we're going to ask, you know, is the labor market in equilibrium? Is the capital market in equilibrium? And then the last question we'll ask is, is the efficiency of production, has that changed? Has productivity declined? We've already talked a little bit about that. I'm going to call these three objects a labor deviation, the extent to which supply and demand aren't coming together, an investment deviation, the sense in which supply, the suppliers of capital, and demand, the users of capital, are not coming together, and then the sense in which there's a disturbance or a change in productivity. Okay, so I'm not going to go into details about how I constructed these, but I'll show you the numbers. And what we're going to see is that just like there were large differences in the source of the drop in output across countries, all in terms of employment in the United States, almost all in terms of productivity in Europe and Japan, we're going to see that these different changes are related to different departures from normality. Okay. So what I've done here is in the upper panel, I've reported the percentage deviation from normal in the labor market and the capital market and in productivity. So, what, so the way to read these is that negative numbers mean that the market's not functioning correctly in such a way as to depress employment and output and investment. And what you'll see is that during an average post-war recession, there's a fairly small change in the way that the labor market works. It's a little bit depressed, but 2% is not big. 13%, which is the number I calculate for the Great Recession, is huge. To give you an idea, it's never been this big other than the Great Depression. And if we have time, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so it's about, it's about uh, five to six times as big as normal in terms of departure. So that's like walking in the doctor's office and he's seen you or she's seen you a number of times before and they say, you know, I checked your temperature, it's 99. A little bit high, but nothing really to worry about. That's what we have here. Down here they say, uh-oh, you've got a fever 103.5. We we've got to give you medication right now and check you in the hospital. <coughs> Here's the capital deviation. And what this means is the extent to which the capital market is not functioning correctly. Well, these are pretty close to zero. And in fact, they're positive numbers, meaning that if anything, paradoxically, during recessions, the capital market seems to work a little better. And this case is very close to zero. So, again, using this analogy about going to the doctor's office, you've walked in and said, I'm not feeling very well, and they've taken your temper and they say, okay, 98.6. Whatever's ailing you is not associated with a fever or the diseases that produce a fever. The third part is productivity, how productivity changes. Well, normally during recessions, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, productivity falls a lot, 2.2%. And to put that in perspective, that means keep everything in the economy the same, all the same people at their jobs, but suddenly they're producing 2.2% less output, less income. So that's a big drop. In and of itself, that's a big drop. Today, basically nothing. No change of productivity. Here's the same statistics produced for the other high-income countries. What you're going to see is essentially, no, the labor market seems to be working pretty well in all these high-income countries. And instead, the culprit is lower productivity. So at a deep level, whatever's ailing the U.S. economy seems to be very different than what's ailing Europe and Japan. And it's manifesting itself in the U.S. through a problem in the labor market it's manifesting itself in these other high-income countries through lower worker productivity. What I've next done, I'm not going to talk about details, is I've taken an economic model that economists frequently use to study recessions, and I've simulated that model in response to the labor market dysfunctionality. And what we see here is that I want you to look at this last row right here. 
which is predicted values. So this is what my model tells me should have happened during the Great Recession if the only dysfunction we saw in the economy was this measure of labor market dysfunction. And what you see is here's predicted, this is what the model tells me should have happened, and here's actual. And what you see is the predicted is very close to the actual. The model tells me there should have been a big drop in output, and there was. There should have been a big drop in labor input, and there was. And there should have been an extraordinarily large drop in business investment, and there was. So this tells me that kind of getting onto the right track, and again, using the analogy of the whodunit, detectives are looking for clues. Clues are pointing to something funny going on in the labor market. The next two pictures I'm going to show you just will give you um, a visual look at how different this labor market dysfunction is, U.S. vis-a-vis the other countries, and productivity is. So here's these labor deviations of this measure of the labor market not functioning well. Here it is in the U.S. between the start of the recession, which was the first quarter of 2008, and it just heads on downhill. In the other high-income countries, no drop. If anything, it looks like the labor market is functioning a little bit better. And here's productivity. Again, we talked about how productivity was, seems to be the culprit in the other high-income countries, not in the U.S. And as those countries enter the Great Recession, and this gray area represents the spread of change in productivity across those seven countries. So at any point in time, those seven countries have productivity declines that you can read just by vertically looking up and down. So large productivity declines, but not so much in the U.S. Okay, so with this data in mind, let's talk about um, let's talk about some different hypotheses about the Great Recession. And there's essentially two that, at least I'm aware of, that are on the table. Um, the most popular one by far is the financial hypothesis, and the second is what I'll call the policy hypothesis. And I've listed some um, prominent economists here who have argued in favor of the policy hypothesis, um, including uh, Edward Prescott, who's a, a Nobel Prize winning economist. Okay, so let's talk about the financial hypothesis. It's pretty straightforward. The basic message is that the declines in the values of asset-backed securities, such as mortgage-backed securities, and failures or near failures of important financial institutions reduce the amount of intermediation services or banking services that were being provided, and this reduction in banking production reduced output employment. Okay, the argument that this was the cause, well, the crisis was very severe, no doubt about that, and the timing, you know, the timing seems to coincide fairly well. Second piece of evidence, economists often associate financial crises with big depressions, such as the Great Depression. The third bit of evidence is that economists do have theoretical economic models in which financial market imperfections reduce employment output. So let's talk about each of these three pieces in turn. Okay, well, the evidence seems certainly very powerful. Uh, many people are convinced of this. Um, and the financial hypothesis may ultimately be why we had such a severe recession. Um, but I want to ask you some questions. How much did intermediation services fall at the aggregate? Actually, let me just kind of take a, a show of hands if people don't mind. Um, do people think that the banking, the bank, you know, banking output, production, banking services fell a lot? Let me just get a show of hands. How, okay, one one brave person. Sure, yeah. Uh, maybe I should maybe, maybe I should have mentioned it as the other way around. Um, so let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that. Um, Somewhat of a surprise, consumer lending largely unchanged, and banking credit did fall, but it didn't fall really until the crisis was over. Here's, a, here's, a, here's the balance sheet of households. So households are what we want to look at because they ultimately own businesses. Um, this measures the total liabilities of households and the, and the non-financial businesses they own. And we see here's the end of 2007 before the crisis, here's the end of 2008 at the height of the crisis, and here's the end of 2009. There's really not much change. 
the stock of liabilities held by households doesn't change very much. The idea that banking services and you couldn't get a loan, and I certainly understand some people couldn't or had difficulty with that, but in the aggregate, that would have led to a large drop in these numbers. We don't see that. And the composition of the numbers isn't very different either. Here's mortgages, corporation and loans, and other. So not a big change. Another way to think of this is that, imagine I tell you we're in the middle of a financial crisis, you'd expect this table to look really quite different. Here's another measure of how much services are produced by the banking sector is the ratio of bank credit to final output GDP. And you see this remarkable run-up in the 2000s, reflecting partially financial innovation and reflecting partially the very popular uh, practice of making subprime loans. And it increased, and it, and it continues to increase, and then it comes down a little bit, still higher than any time it was in, in our recent history. What I want you to take away from this is that the banking sector didn't collapse in terms of the amount of services they're providing the economy. Um, so this is, uh, this, this is something that really is not very well known, particularly among, among, among lay people. Here's a picture of loans and leases through 2008. What I've done here is I've indicated on the timeline some important events. This was the failure of Bear Stearns uh, Investment Bank in March. September and October are certainly an interesting period. Uh, the failure of Lehman Brothers, the bailout plan, TARP, failure of Washington Mutual, and Wachovia has taken over. And again, not much of a change in lending. What about the models that economists use to try to understand how financial crises can reduce uh, employment output. Well, remember that investment deviation we constructed before. All of the theories economists currently have to think about how financial crises or reductions in the output of uh, banking services contribute to recession operate through that investment deviation. That is, the banking sector is not functioning well, which means the capital market is not functioning well. Supply and demand are not being equated. That's how all those economic theories work. And it's not surprising if we have a substantial disruption in the financial system, where is that going to have its biggest impact? In the capital market. If you remember those pictures I showed you before, those numbers, we don't see that. Well, how about the Great Depression? You know, I, I'm guessing most of you are, you know, if you're not reading a newspaper, you're looking at um, uh, media blogs, and all the comparisons you saw between the Great Depression in the 1930s and the Great Recession. Okay, President Obama talked about it. Before him, President Bush talked about it. You couldn't get away from comparisons between these two. My specialty is economic crises. And um, you know, during the fall of 2008 and early 2009, I was probably getting four or five questions or calls per week from newspaper reporters and from TV about this. So the standard view about the Great Depression is that it started out as just an ordinary recession. And then, you know, for those of you who've seen the old movie with Jimmy Stewart, It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> people, okay, so some people have, you remember the Bailey Savings and Loan, Jimmy Stewart and his bride are ready to go off on a honeymoon, but the Bailey Savings and Loan is being run. Everybody runs into the bank to get out their deposits. Now that's a problem for a bank because banks hold only a small fraction of your deposits in available funds. Instead, they invest in a variety of projects. So when a bank run happens, the bank can quickly run out of cash, and then the bank's in trouble. So if you remember in that movie, they never won their honeymoon because they took all their wedding money and paid out all the depositors. And when, they, when, when the last one was out the door, you know, they had no money left. Uh, and they never went on that, on that honeymoon. Well, again, sort of a myth about the Great Depression, two myths really, that the crises were quantitatively large and the timing coincides with the Depression. Well, both of those are true. In 1930, the share of deposits in banks that either failed, which was very small, or suspended operations for a short period of time, that happens when you walk in and you say, you know what, come back in a week. We don't have the money now. That's a banking suspension, not a failure. 
they closed down for a few days in order to get some more cash. Just 2% of all deposits. 2% 1934, 1% 1931, 2% 1932, 1933, which is, the, which is when the economy begins to recover, is a bit of an aberration this bank holiday. Then. But 2%, 4%, 2%, not big numbers. Another way to think about that is that 98% of deposits are in banks that are having no trouble whatsoever. 96% of deposits are in banks that are having no trouble whatsoever. Banking crises in the Great Depression were not quantitatively large. And the timing doesn't work very well either. This is a picture that shows you hours worked or employment in the industrial sector. And I start in January 1929, before the Great Depression, before the stock market crash. And I end here in October 1930 because Milton Friedman, you know, great economist, former Nobel Prize winner, argued that we had a banking crisis in November 1930. Now, it was located in Nashville, Tennessee, and didn't really spread beyond that. But all I'm going to do here is just show you how much economic activity fell before, before the first banking crisis. Well, we're in the middle of a Great Depression, I hate to say here. The industrial sector has declined 30% before the first banking crisis, and it was a small one, ever hit. It's simply not true that we had a garden variety recession that was then turned into a Great Depression via banking panics and via large declines in the money supply. The, the green dash and the green solid line is measures the money supply, the two measures that Milton Friedman liked to look at. There's no big decline. So the punchline is the Great Depression was indeed great. It was great before any type of contraction in the money supply. It was, it was indeed great before any type of banking difficulties. So again, that analogy, gee, you know, Ben Bernanke, the chair of the Federal Reserve, he's not going to let this turn into another Great Depression. Well, no, ma no matter what happened then, we would have had a Great Depression. Okay, now let me suggest that there's some other myths out there about the financial sector. Um, one is that, you know, certainly reporters that call me during this period, um, you know, frequently asking questions, you know, what about, nobody can get a loan, business is going to come to a standstill. Well, among major business, investment is almost entirely financed internally. What that means is that major corporations, so Microsoft, 3M, IBM, Almost all the investment they do is from their internal cash. Those companies have enormous internal cash positions. 84% uh, of, of investment is financed internally, including small businesses. And two-thirds of firms do not even use external finance, don't even use bank lending. Let me show you a couple more pictures. Um, <clears throat> here's a picture that shows capital spending and available funds. Available funds. Available funds is the cash within a corporation. So what this tells you is that at any point in time, corporations or corporations can very easily fund their investment, never even having to talk to a banker. They might be saying, well, I understand how Microsoft and IBM have billions of dollars sitting available, but what about the little guys? Okay, so what about the little guys? Well, this, that suggests that you know, maybe Microsoft and IBM can ride out the recession much better than the corner mom and pop grocery. If that's the case, then the corner mom and pop grocery should contract a lot more because they can't get that back financing. Well, maybe they can, maybe they can't. But what this table shows is simply a histogram of how sales at large, medium, and small companies changed. And what this shows is the share of sales by firm asset size before the recession in fourth quarter 2007, at the height of the financial crisis 2008, and then a year later. Okay. Now, what this histogram shows is that you know companies with more than a billion dollars in assets do a lot of the selling in this country. That's certainly true, but the share they account for was very very similar over time. How about the smallest companies? These are companies with between $250,000 and $500,000 of assets. These are the smallest, the smallest companies. They obviously don't sell a lot because they're small, but 
their relative importance in the economy didn't decline. Under the standard, the standard assumption is the small ones were just him. Well, that's just not true. Um, I'm thinking I'm getting a little short in time, so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to uh, skip a couple of slides. Um, another idea you may have heard is that you know we're in for a long, long bad period because when economies go through financial crises, they take a long time to recover. Well, it really depends a lot on the policies that they follow afterwards. Here's a picture of GDP between Finland and Japan. They both had financial crises in the early 1990s. And Japan, as well known, followed a program of propping up weak banks, who in turn took government funds and, it out, and loaned it out to their near and solvent customers. What, le what happened in Japan is that 15-year period of stagnation decline. Finland was very aggressive. They told the banking system, get your act together. We're not going to prop you up. And Finland did have a pretty serious recession. Japan's was stretched out for a long period of time. Finland had a quick recession and then recovered very early, uh, quite quickly. Similar picture in Chile and Mexico. Mexico kept poor banks in, in business. Chile didn't. Chile had a remarkable recovery. Mexico continued to stack. Um, I mentioned consumer lending didn't change very much. Well, consumer lending actually rose throughout the recession. And the National Bureau of Economic Research says this is when the recession is over, and only then does it decline. I'm going to skip this slide. So really any story that tries to help us deeply understand the financial theory of the recession requires us to come to grips with the idea that you know many facts facts about the financial system and the economy are simply out of line. And moreover, your tax dollars were placed in those banks in fall of 2008. That's almost two and a half years ago. So Citibank, Bank of America, they've got tons of cash in. If it was just the financial system, why haven't we recovered by now? It's been a long time. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about this policy hypothesis. And the idea there is that government policymakers panicked a bit they put into place what I call crisis management policies. There's always an enormous demand for crisis management policies that arise during any economic crisis in which can politically important, politically connected to constituents or groups go to the government and say, we need to be rescued. And it certainly happened here. Banks were rescued. GM was rescued. Chrysler was rescued. They're all important. You know, the mom and pop store down the street that failed, they didn't get rescued because they are not that important to the overall economy. And many economists say many of these policies weren't designed very well. In the fact, they weren't communicated very well. In particular, some economists talk about the fact that in September of 2008, Hank Paulson, Secretary of Treasury, went to George Bush and said, if we don't pass TARP, that was the Tro Troubled Asset Relief Program, that was the program that was going to in which the government was going to buy up all these subprime mortgage-backed securities. If, we, if Congress doesn't pass this, we may not have an economy another week. Well, that next day, that next day, every newspaper had the headline, George Bush says we're on the precipice of another Great Depression. You know, there's something to be said about not crying fire in the crowded theater, and some economists think this was a case of the government crying fire in the crowded theater. Because immediately after this period, immediately after this period, the economy really went in the tank. Now, the financial crisis working at about the same time, so it's hard to disentangle the two, but let's take a look at some pictures. Here's a picture of non-farm employment, and one reason economists have advocated this policy hypothesis that some government programs, and I want to emphasize just some, not all, some government programs didn't work very well. So here's the, um, here is the pattern of employment, and you see things really go down the drain here. Here's the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that was advertised to keep unemployment from going above, I believe, you know, seven or seven and a half percent. Well, it went almost, almost to, almost to uh, about ten percent. And you see employment really falling very, very quickly as we have TARP announced, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act passed, cash for clunkers. And then employment just stays down. And here's the unemployment rate, just the flip side of that. 
one thing you should be aware of is all these government programs are very expensive. This is a picture of federal government debt. Total public debt is a percentage of GDP. We're at about 100% of debt. What that means is that if we were to pay off all the debt we owe, and some of it is to ourselves, but some of it is to other countries, including China, who's purchased a lot of federal debt, we'd have to give up one year's worth of GDP. 100% is very high. We've never had it that high in this country, with the exception of World War II, where the government had to, had to spend a lot of money, obviously, to fight the <coughs> war. Um, one aspect of policy, almost all economists agree didn't work well, was the idea of temporary tax rebates. So the government, both in 2008 and 2009, sent primarily to low-income and middle-income households tax rebate checks. And the idea was, you know, consumers aren't spending enough, but we can just get them to spend more, and then those dollars go into businesses, and businesses hire more people. You know, sounds kind of good, but for those of you who have heard about Milton Friedman's permanent income hypothesis, Friedman emphasized that temporary transient changes in income aren't going to be spent by consumers because when they spend today, they're looking not at just their income today, but their prospects tomorrow and in the future. And that's exactly what happened. So here's the increase in disposable personal income. This is all those stimulus checks going in the mail. What happened to consumer spending? Nothing. Just increased a lot. Just, just raised, increased the federal debt substantially. This is a picture from economist John Taylor, who is um, Under Secretary uh, Treasury under um, uh, both George W. Bush and George uh, H. Bush. And what he emphasizes is that this is department store sales in Target. So he was able to get daily sales at Target. And for those of you taking some statistics and econometrics, this is a regression line. This is a trend. And Taylor says, you know, we were having a mild recession, and here's sales are hugging the trend line, and then he extrapolates the trend line, and then he says, when did everything really go down the drain? Well, right here. This is when Paulson and Bush start talking about the Great Depression. Then people say, government's talking about Great Depression. I don't, what, what is this about? I better be careful and safe. I was thinking about buying a car today, or a big ticket item. But I think I'm going to wait and just see how the economy evolves over time. I don't, I don't absolutely have to have a new car today. I can wait a few months. Well, that kind of wait and see attitude is what Taylor thinks about when he interprets this line. So we see the big collapse in sales at Target following those statements. And um, here are some pictures. Um, I'm not, going to go, I'm not going to show you them all because I'm running out of time. Uh, that supports Taylor's theory. This is the spread between LIBOR, the London Interbank Operator, so short, this is a measure of short run borrowing costs, and interest rates in the United States. And the idea is that when this spread increases, that's a sign of some type of distress. Well, what happens is that we get a little bit of an increase after the Lehman bankruptcy, but we get a huge increase right after. Paulson and Bernanke and Bush start talking about another Great Depression. And it skyrockets. And it begins to go down after the government completely reverses course and says, initially we were going to ask about, we were going to think that TARP was going to purchase these mortgage-backed securities. We have no idea how to value them. There was a very bad reaction, negative reaction to that. And then the government said, you know, we're not going to do that. We're going to take an equity position in banks which most economists think should have been the, the, the practice from, from the get-go. Okay. Um, I have, uh, I'm going to skip a couple of pictures. Let me show you this one. This one's great. It shows you sort of the futility of some government programs intended to stimulate the economy. This is cash for clunkers. So you're going to get a new car. The government's going to give you a check for your old one. And the idea is your old one's not worth very much. And they're just going to scrap it. This was, this was, this, the, the, the effort here was to increase the demand for autos, help out Detroit. Well, what happened? Big increase during cash versus clunkers, then it's back down, and in fact, lower than it was in the fall of 2008 when the crisis was, was at its peak. Similar picture for mortgage modifications. Um, and the, I'm uh, sorry, the, um, uh, the, uh, the tax credit for mortgage buyers. Big increase during when you could get a seven or $8,000 tax credit. And after that, boom. Again, 
again, sales much, much lower now than in the fall of 2008. Okay, let me go ahead and wrap up. Um, Great Recession is all about a big and very persistent loss due to labor market dysfunction, unlike any other U.S. recession. So if it's a financial crisis, then why does it manifest itself in terms of labor markets? Why hasn't employment come back? My own view is that labor market distortions reflect uncertainty concerns by employers. So they see all these different government programs, and they're saying, I don't know what's going to happen with tax policy. I don't know what's going to happen with government regulation. I think I'll increase the hours of work by my existing employees and not necessarily add new people. So I think that's been an important part of why we haven't come back, and certainly among employers, and the loss in the value of human capital. What I mean by that is nearly half of the employment loss in this current recession is among workers who are relatively low skilled. They're, work, they're earning near the minimum wage. What we know is that during recessions, workers who are displaced suffer a loss in the value, the market value of their skill set. And what that means is that you suddenly no longer as valuable to an employer. Unemployment insurance can be um, very, very attractive. And that's not to make any normative statements about the unemployment, rather just see from a purely economic point of view, if unemployment benefits are near the market value of your human capital, then you certainly have an incentive to not take a job now, continue to search, continue to look. Um, of course, the problem with that is that as workers stay at work longer, they suffer further deterioration in the value of their skills. So let me just close on, uh, on a note of you know, where we might think about in terms of going forward for policies. So the governor's tried all sorts of short-run things. You know, some maybe had some benefit, uh, and I think the pictures I showed suggest that some had some large costs. So the time is now to get away from short-term fix-its, forget the band-aids, focus on sensible long-run fiscal changes. Every recent administration, whether it was uh, Democratic under Clinton or Republican under Bush, has put together tax reform commissions. And every one of these commissions, every panel has said the same thing, whether it was under Republican or Democratic administration, change taxes that encourage newer hiring and investment and convince people that that's going to be a permanent part of our economic landscape. Reduce government spending. We have a high debt. And it's time to address entitlements. Because the baby boom and subsequent baby bust, Social Security becomes a more and more important looming issue. Um, there's always an incentive for politicians to kick a can down the road because none of them want to deal with it. It's politically unpopular. But the time has come to, it to, uh, to address Social Security and address other um, unfunded government liabilities. In my opinion, if we do this, we can, get, uh, we can back up on the road to recovery and have a remarkable recovery, one of which we're adding about half a million jobs per month rather than an average of 100,000, which is what we've been adding um, in the last few months. Uh, so let me just say thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I'd be happy to chat with you in terms of questions. Uh, <laughs> the great reception. <laughs> <laughs>